All right, so today we will be responding to a, or reacting to a video called Seven Little Known Facts About the First World War. So we're going to see uh, what they have for us and see if there's anything I can add to it. Or maybe I get to learn something new. So let's dive right in. The First World War was a turning point in history. Its origins lay in the days of glorious empire but was fought with the technologies of the future, such as tanks, aircrafts, and submarines. Popular history tells the story of World War I being confined to the mud of static trench warfare and mass slaughter as men went over the top, but there was much more to this devastating global conflict. Here we look at seven insane facts related to the Great War fought between the Allies and the Central Powers. The potency of weapons such as the machine gun and artillery force both sides to begin digging trenches with which to first protect their own soldiers and secondly provide a defensive line with which to block the enemy's advance. Very quickly both sides in Western Europe tried to outflank the other forcing them to keep extending the length of their trench network until they comprised approximately some 25,000 miles in total. These composed a front line supporting and linking trenches that reach from the English Channel down to the Swiss border. The ground between opposing trenches was known as no man's land, for it was here that much of the killing would take place as one side would go over the top and attack the other. Often there was very little in the way of cover in this area and so when particularly heavy shells exploded, they were making large craters, it was not uncommon for efforts to be made to capture them, allowing one side to get closer to the enemy during an attack. British poet Siegfried Sassoon wrote, when all is done and said, the war was mainly a matter of holes and ditches. Hollywood has long enjoyed envisioning armies of the dead being pitted against the living, but for a number of German troops fighting against Imperial Russia on the eastern front of World War I, it seemed to become a reality one day in July 1915. As early as the second month of the war, the German army began an effort to dislodge Russian troops holding the Oswick Fortress in modern-day Poland. However, the effort failed as did two other major assaults in the first half of 1915. By the summer of 1915, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg had assumed command of the German troops and made it his mission to finally crush the fortress defenders. The Russians had largely evacuated the fortress by this time, but a defensive force was left in place to keep holding it for as long as possible, and the fortress afforded them significant protection. Therefore, von Hindenburg decided to change tactics and planned to engulf the fortress in poison gas knowing the Russians lacked any gas masks. With the arrival of a favorable wind on August 6th with which to carry the gas, von Hindenburg ordered the attack to get underway. The fortress was engulfed with a chlorine cloud that convinced the Germans that all the defendants were dead, and so they were confident of victory when they began their advance. What they encountered, however, horrified them. Not all the Russians were dead, and those that were still alive defended their fort once again. However, the gas had left many of them covered in blood and blisters all over their bodies. Many of them had their faces covered with a white cloth stained with coughed up blood while their eyes were tinted red. Many of the attacking Germans were overcome with fear with the sight of the nearly dead men fighting. Yeah, so just pause it right there. Uh, chlorine gas was probably one of the worst weapons of the war. Um, what it does is it actually burns out the parts of your lungs that hold in oxygen, normally killing you very quickly but very painfully. If that doesn't happen, it can actually terribly burn your skin, uh, your eyes, nose, throat, it's supposed to be extremely painful, and those who die are probably the lucky ones compared to the survivors, although the survivors are often uh, not too common in this type of warfare. Firing at them. Many even believe they were fighting ghosts. 
Once again, the attack on the fortress failed as the German formation collapsed in a wave of fear and confusion at what was taking place. Reporting on the incident, newspapers called the incident the attack of the dead men. War has long been a breeding ground for superstition. With so many men getting killed, their survivors would often be left wondering if there was some higher force at work protecting them, and if they could control that force somehow. One such superstition took hold of British troops in and around the French town of Albert near the Somme River. In the town, mounted on top of the Albert Basilica, was a golden statue of the Madonna holding her child up into the sky. In early 1915, the Madonna was damaged by an artillery shell and tipped on its side, although it did not fall. It would spend the following years leaning forward almost at a right angle to the ground above the British troops who began to see it as something of a divine sign. Whispers began that as long as the statue stayed in place, that it was a sign the Allies would win the war. However, if the statue fell, then it was equally a sign that the Germans would win. In 1918, the Germans launched their spring offensive and British commanders decided the tower would make a great observation point from which to direct artillery fire. Despite concerns and some protests among the ranks, the Madonna was finally knocked to the ground, but while the war wasn't lost, the town did fall to the Germans before being retaken four months later. The Basilica was rebuilt after the war and the Golden Madonna was replaced. It has since become a tourist attraction where visitors can not only climb the tower and see the surrounding battlefields, but they can also hear the strange story of the superstition surrounding the Leaning Madonna. The First World War has been described as one of the first technology wars and that whomever had the best technology had the biggest advantage on the battlefield. The machine gun gave one soldier the ability to kill hundreds of enemies. The aerial plane could reveal enemy movements and direct allied artillery with extraordinary efficiency, while at sea, the submarine could threaten even the most powerful of enemy battleships thanks to its key feature, its stealth. The British Admiralty was famously disdainful of submarines in the early days with Admiral Sir Arthur Wilson describing them as underhand, underwater, and damned un-English. However, the British were not ignorant of the effectiveness of the submarines and began an extensive building program to give the Royal Navy a powerful submarine force. But early submarines were small, short-range, and only really suited to operating close to land. The Royal Navy, on the other hand, envisioned building a fleet of larger and more powerful submarines that could sail far out into the sea in support of the Grand Fleet. In essence, they wanted to build what were, in effect, underwater battleships in the belief that Britannia should rule below the waves as well as above them. The result was the K-class steam-powered submarine. These underwater behemoths were four times the size of the earlier E-class submarines that were the backbone of the British submarine fleet in World War I. While traveling on the surface, they would use oil-fired steam engines to allow them to keep up with the battle fleet whereas nearly all other submarines used diesel engines. They did not have diesel generators to charge the large banks of batteries that would power them when submerged. However, the envisioned role for the K-Class was to have them sail undetected behind an imposing enemy fleet as it engaged the Royal Navy's battle fleet and ambushed them with torpedoes. The first completed example was the HMS K-3, which was launched in May 1916. Trials revealed numerous technical problems, particularly concerning handling on the surface and the transition from steaming to operating on battery power. It took a worryingly long time for the submarine to dive which would make it vulnerable as spotted by enemy ships who could outgun it on the surface. However, as more examples were completed, the enemy was frankly the least of the crew's K-class worries. In December 1916, K-3 with the future King George VI aboard uncontrollably dived. The sub plunged to 150 feet on the seabed. It took 20 minutes to free the sub from the mud and surface successfully. K-13 would sink on January 19, 1917 during sea trials when an intake failed to close whilst diving and her engine room flooded. 
The sub was salvaged and recommissioned as K-22 in March 1917. K-1 collided with K-4 off the Danish coast on November 18, 1917, and fearing this supposed superweapon might be captured by the Germans, it was scuttled by its crew. Two months later, K-4 ran aground on Walney Island while being stranded there for some considerable time before being pulled off. However, worse was to come for the unlucky K-4 and K-Class itself. On January 31st, 1918, a number of the class were sailing in formation when the lead sub, K-17, collided with the cruiser HMS Fearless. In the resulting chaos, K-4 was nearly cut in half in a collision with K-6 before K-7 finished the job, colliding with K-4 which was sent into the bottom of the sea for good, killing another entire crew. At the same time, K-22, which had already killed its earlier crew as K-13 collided with K-14, although both survived. In just 75 minutes, two submarines had been sunk, three badly damaged, and 105 sailors had been killed. Not one sailor aboard a K-class submarine was killed by the enemy during the war, and they only ever fired on the enemy once, but the torpedo failed to detonate. Despite this appalling record, the Royal Navy kept the submarines in service until 1931, but the accidents didn't stop with the end of the war. Their reputation was such that crews nicknamed the K-Class the Calamity Class, Calamity being spelled with a K. So the interesting thing with World War I is that there were so many new technologies being used. Submarines, new types of battleships, aircraft, machine guns, tanks, many things that were relatively new or brand new to uh, world wars. The problem was, one, half the stuff people didn't even know how to use. The first use of tanks, uh, they were just winging it. Um, aircraft started off as just scouts and early on air battles literally consisted of men with guns shooting at each other. You would have a pilot and you would have a backseat with a guy with pistol or rifle of some kind um, firing at other planes until they eventually got the idea to put a machine gun on it. But that would weigh the plane down with its maneuverability. With the submarines, they talked about the engines, but the steam engines on submarines, which was the steam engine was a uh, very old technology at this time. The diesel engine was replacing it and would replace it for quite some time. Um, but the use of steam engines on a submarine is just very backwards, but it was actually very common uh, among earlier versions of the German submarines and obviously by the British submarines, along with many of the ships that were used on both sides of the war. Despite some early misgivings, military commanders quickly embraced the aeroplane as a tool of war, and the Royal Navy was especially enthusiastic. They soon began looking at ways of taking aircraft to sea to support the fleet as well as fitting floats to aircraft so that they could be raised and lowered in and out of the water by a crane on the ship. They also built ramps atop the guns of battleships for the planes to fly off from. Of course, what was really needed was a floating airfield, and this led to the conversion of several ships, such as the battlecruiser HMS Furious, to become the first aircraft carriers. In the case of HMS Furious, the conversion was less than ideal. The battlecruiser's forward turret was removed, and a flight deck fitted in its place, however the main superstructure and aft turret remained. Thus, rather than being a Yeah, again, it's a new technology that was experimented with, uh, came sort of out of necessity of trying to up the opponent, but it was something that no one really knew how to do. No one had any idea how to go about this. It was a lot of just guesswork and experimentation, uh, seeing what worked and figuring things out. It wouldn't really be until much later after the war that everyone would start figuring everything out. They'd go back and look at what worked, what didn't work, and start figuring things out. But during World War One. Things were pretty experimental across the board. A true flat top, as carriers would become known, pilots landing on Furious had an immense obstacle in their way just before the flight deck, which they had to contend with when landing. 
the first pilots were expected to approach the ship from astern, fly alongside it, and once they passed the superstructure, sidestep onto the flight deck. After the conversion was completed, trials began in August 1917. On August 2nd, 1917, Squadron Commander Edwin Dunning successfully accomplished this daunting feat by putting his Sopwith pup down onto the deck and in doing so became the first pilot to land on a moving ship. A few days later, he did it again, but on his third attempt on August 7th, an updraft over the deck hit his port wing, sending his light aircraft over the side of the ship and into the sea. The unfortunate aviator drowned in his cockpit, having been knocked unconscious during the landing attempt. It was clear this method was unsatisfactory, and the ship underwent another conversion to have the aft turret removed and another flight deck fitted. A gantry with vertical cables hanging down to the deck was fitted to prevent the aircraft landing on the aft deck from plowing into the superstructure, but gases from the ship's funnel disrupted the air over the deck which was potentially deadly for the rather light aircraft of the day. Consequently, the decision was made that Furious would primarily function by launching aircrafts which then have to land on the shore or ditch in the sea near the fleet once their mission was accomplished. This allowed Furious to carry out the first airstrike launched from an aircraft carrier on July 19, 1918. After the war, Furious underwent a major rebuild to remove the superstructure, and at last, the vessel became a true flat top. Furious served throughout World War II and was withdrawn from service in 1945. Given Japan's major role as an enemy to the Western powers in World War II, it is often forgotten that the Japanese actually fought alongside the Allies against the Central Powers in World War I. At the dawn of the 20th century, Japan was a burgeoning empire in its own right, modeling itself on the way European powers had expanded outwards during their rises to power. In 1902, Japan and Great Britain signed a naval treaty aimed at containing the expansion of Russian and then later German naval forces in the Pacific and Far East. Off the back of this cooperation, Japan declared war on the Central Powers on August 23, 1914, with Japanese land forces later capturing German territory in the Far East, but it was Japan's impressive navy that was one of the biggest interests to the Allies. Not only was it large, powerful, and modern, but it was combat proven, having famously defeated the Russian fleet at the Battle of Tsushima in 1906, the first Asian navy to defeat a European one in combat. The Japanese fleet helped protect British trade routes in the Pacific, freeing up the British fleet to concentrate on combating the Germans in European waters. When the United States joined the war in 1917, Japanese warships took over many patrol duties in the Pacific, including, at one time, protecting a certain U.S. Navy base in Hawaii, called Pearl Harbor. But while the Allies expected to face off in large-scale naval battles between fleets of opposing warships, as had happened in countless wars before, this rarely happened. Instead, the Allies found themselves having to contend with an elusive, sneaky, and deadly enemy in the form of German and Austro-Hungarian submarines. The Central Powers inflicted shocking losses on the Allies with this underwater weapon, and by 1917, the need for more warships to combat them led to a request for Japan to deploy warships in the Mediterranean Sea. On March 11, 1917, Admiral Seto Koso aboard the Suma-class cruiser Akashi along with eight destroyers sailed west from Singapore arriving in Malta on April 13. Known as the Japanese Navy's second special squadron, the Asian fleet provided escort for a number of Allied convoys, earning the respect of their European counterparts. Two of the squadron destroyers were torpedoed by enemy submarines, but despite heavy damage and loss of life, they remained afloat. Sadly, the respect of the Western Allies did not last long after the war. In fact, the United States was alarmed by the effectiveness of Japanese naval forces, believing they could threaten American interests in Asia and the Pacific, and so made efforts to limit Japanese naval strength in the post-war arms limitation agreements. This led to the resentment on the part of the Japanese who began to fear that their empire in Asia was being eroded by the ungrateful Americans and British who weren't even native to their continent. Yeah, and that's something that we see over and over again is that if someone comes to the aid of someone else, they're often seen as um, not being grateful for the help and 
resentment lets in. When it does, it's hard to remove that, and it's not that much of a surprise that Japan and America would go to war later, um, considering everything that went on. Japanese really put a lot on the line in World War One. They were trying to expand themselves um, in in the Far East by taking the German colonies, and they went to great lengths to protect a lot of the colonies held by the British and even the French, but they were never really treated fairly for what they did, and they took a lot of casualties and were an equally powerful force uh, in the naval warfare as many of the European powers were, uh, even the Americans. Oh, this is good. Yeah. It is well known that the Nazi leader Adolf Hitler served in the trenches of World War I with the German army. Despite being of Austrian birth, this experience shaped the man he would become later. However, it is less known that fighting in the trenches also shaped one of his most defining physical features, namely his toothbrush mustache, but he didn't always sport this style of facial hair. In fact, when he joined the army in 1914, he actually sported a style of mustache known as the Kaiser mustache, which grew out past the corners of the lips and was styled upwards mirroring, as the name suggests, the German Kaiser. However, as poison gas began to see widespread use on the battlefield, Hitler, like his comrades, was expected to carry a gas mask, but the long mustache got in the way of it fitting safely on his face. He was therefore ordered by his commanders to shave off his mustache, something which he obviously didn't relish the idea of. He therefore decided to restyle it to the now familiar toothbrush style which had been introduced to Germany by American businessmen and travelers in the years leading up to the war keeping it until his suicide in his Berlin bunker in 1945. The style became so affiliated with the Nazi leader that it quickly fell out of fashion in America despite being very popular in the 1920s and 30s. So yeah, they, they covered a lot of good points, a lot of interesting things in that video. Um, Hitler's mustache, I did know about that, and we actually do see that a lot of men who fought in the wars and were older, uh, usually 50s and 60s or older, kept the mustache until they died even into the, into the 60s. Despite its connotation, it really wasn't until later that it became considered more offensive um, after it had fallen out of fashion. Young people didn't do it, and they regarded as being um, offensive because of Hitler. But a lot of older men kept the mustache for a very long time, usually for the rest of their lives. Um, and you know, going back to some of the things that they talked about, definitely over and over again we just see crazy new technologies try being tried out, things being tried out, nobody really had an idea what they are doing with, uh, they didn't know how to go about it and they had to try over and over again to get it right. And that was very, very common in World War I, uh, much less common in World War II. It was definitely something that defined World War I in many ways, and no one really knew quite what they were getting into at the beginning. The war had changed drastically by the end. Um, so I'm going to end the video there. So please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Um, I will be posting more out very soon. Um, anything you want me to react to, please put it in the comment section. I do both history and um, alternative history videos. So please send me what you want me to react to, and I'll do my best. Thank you.